Welcome to the Authentic Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Andrea John. Today, we continue our journey through the Gospel of John. This Bible study is recorded live on Thursday nights with a group of people who get together to dive deep into the scriptures. So in addition to mine, you'll hear some different voices. You'll hear questions and commentaries, perspectives. We don't all agree. We all bring something different to the table, but it lends itself to a conversation that goes deep and leads us further into the knowing and loving of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for listening because this adds to the conversation. And if you have something to add, to share, or if you have a question, you can always email me at hello at andreajohn.com. Welcome to session nine, where we begin our journey through John four. We are going to dig deep into the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. We're gonna talk about that amazing encounter and what Jesus says about worship and living water. We're gonna learn about the different cultural and historical aspects that bring this story to life and can bring transformation. So let's get started and find some treasure. Oh, just one more thing. Before we dive into the Bible study, I'd like to ask that you like and subscribe to this YouTube or podcast channel. This will help increase the odds that someone will find this life-giving content. Don't forget to share it with your family and friends. Let's get started. actually want to do something a little bit different today um, with this story, kind of take a little bit of a different approach. Um, so what I wanted to do was read the whole story. Um, so it would be John 4, 1, and then we would end it at verse 30. Um so I'll read it. And then what I would like to do is, you don't have to, but if you want to, um, I'd like to have a discussion about what does this, what is this telling you about God? Because I believe that the scriptures are here to reveal God to us. And then also, Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father to us. Uh, so I want to talk through, within the context of this story, what aspects of God's nature is this telling us? What is this revealing to us about God? So I will read it. Um, and I'm going to read it out of the NET because I have read it out of and ASB like tons and tons of times. So I'm gonna, for the first time, read it out of NET. So it's a little bit different for me because sometimes it, it helps. John 4, 1. Now when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was winning and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and set out once more for Galilee. But he had to pass through Samaria. Now he came to a Samaritan town called Sakar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, since he was tired from the journey, sat right beside the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink, for his disciples had gone off into the town to buy supplies. So the Samaritan... So the Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for water to drink? For, Jew for Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you had known the gift of God and who it is who said this to you, give me some water to drink, and you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said to him, you have no bucket and what and the well is deep where then do you get this living water surely you're not greater than our ancestor jacob are you for he gave us this well and drank from it himself along with his sons and his livestock jesus replied 
everyone who drinks some of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks some of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. But the water I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And he said to her, go call your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, right, right you are when you said I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. This you said truthfully. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you people say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit and the people who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. Whenever he comes, he will tell us everything. And Jesus said to her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Now at that very moment, his disciples came back. They were shocked because he was speaking with a woman. However, no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left her water jar, went off into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Surely he, surely he can't be the Messiah, can he? So they left the town and began coming to him. So in that story, uh, whether it's something you notice now or maybe something that you've always perceived from this story about God, what, like, what to you, what, and this is for anyone who wants to share, for you, what is this passage revealing about God to you? That he does not reach out to a peculiar to a peculiar people. He'll reach out to anyone. It doesn't matter what they believe or do not believe. Uh, his heart is to save people. So he'll do whatever he has to do to convince people that he is real. But he's not going to force, nowhere in the Bible teaches us that he'll force people to follow him. He just shows up, he'll say what he has to say, he'll do what he has to do, and it's up to to the people to say yes or deny him. He'll also, I like the fact that um, he said to her, he already knew she didn't have a husband. That was so cool. It's like, uh, how does he know that? <laughs> <laughs> so in right? that, what does that reveal about God? In that, like, since he's it stood knowing. out to you, what does it reveal to about him to you? That he's all knowing. I mean, that's my interpretation. I know other people have their own. That's the way I see it. I mean, it was like, oh, wow, God actually knows. He He knows more about you than you think. Yep. Well, if we don't believe that he knows everything, then we, we have to assume in this story that he heard some gossip on the way to the well. <laughs> or, or on the way to the well, he heard something. Oh. You know that lady over there? You know this? <laughs> yep. This is just me trying to say something. There is an interesting take on that, but I, I if we don't have time today, maybe next week, but um, we'll address it then because I don't want to take the focus off of um, the story just yet because this story is um, really rich. To me, I didn't really think so. I knew I was going to ask this question, but I didn't think ahead of time. This, this, one of the reasons this is my favorite story is because God numerous times, I feel like when he has spoken to me in different phases of my life, he always points me back to this story. And I can even go back in journals and read it to you that he would have me come here 
and I would read it and I love the story, but there were times where I was like, what is he trying to tell me? He's trying to tell me something, but the concept of water, you know, like he is the living water. He quenches our thirst. You know, he was once again, using this parable, using an analogy of something that he's trying to show, Hey, when I created the world, I created humans in a way that they need water and they can't live without water. And in the natural, you have water and it'll quench your thirst and you have to be coming back. But in the spirit, if you drink of me and you have me, you won't thirst. What's interesting about that is that it's not like you just drink of him once. You know what I mean? It's not like you're like, oh, I have God today and then that's it. I don't need God anymore because I took him in once and that's enough. But it's like when you when you have him, he's trying to show like in me, you're going to find everything you need. You don't need to be dependent on water. You need to be dependent on me. Another thing that I God that I feel God is revealing is in the latter part when they're talking about worship and Jesus says um, now is a time where those who who truly worship worship in spirit and in truth and Jesus says that you know there's going to be a time where it's not going to be up on this mountain which take note of that what I'm just saying and it's not going to be in Jerusalem it's going to be everywhere um and to me that's God saying my presence isn't just going to abide any longer in just specific areas. Heaven isn't just going to meet earth in specific sacred areas, but there will come a time where all of the space will be accessible and you can worship me there in that space. And I mean, back to the Holy Spirit, the, to me, that's kind of what he's alluding to like when the spirit comes you won't need to be in a particular latitude and longitude of earth to worship you're going to be able to do it anywhere because of holy spirit yeah so in a way the way you're speaking like what you just read now the time has come when you will worship in spirit and in truth that means they were worshiping the wrong thing, the wrong gods. Yeah. As as God warned his people, many times he kind of told them, you're so phony. You praise me with your lips, but your heart is so far from me. That's kind of a subliminal message that yeah. he's telling the woman right here. And yeah, again, that's interesting. I yeah, never thought of again, that. Because she, she, he knows that she'll say that in her mountain mount jerusalem that's where the, you know the re, that's the real mountain the real place to worship and god is kind of, jesus is kind of telling her look, look it's not there it's not down in jerusalem it's not about a physical it's not about a physical location it does not matter where you are it matters uh that I am present and I am present anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the spirit and truth, right? It's when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, to me, the entire Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is bringing the importance of your heart and your motives and what's going on inside. Because according to the law, if you were, you could technically, you could be following the law, but your heart could still be messed up and mm -hmm. broken and so in in like fashion to the sermon on the mount um in matthew 5 to 7 you know i i can see that here jesus is saying those who worship me who worship god they're gonna worship in spirit and in truth so it, it's gonna go beyond a physical thing it's not going to be about you know you sacrificing an animal or what your clothes looks like or where you are 
or if you're obeying these rules, but it's about you doing it beyond the physical with all of yourself, all of your soul and in truth, which means it's a matter of the heart. You can't hide anything when you come before God. And this is something that I feel is a struggle today because so many people have a hard time coming to God and truly bearing their souls. Like imagining that if you're before God, you could just reveal your heart fully 100% or even, you know, how many people would feel comfortable if their heart or their life was to be blasted on a screen for everyone to see, you know? And I think that we all have to come to this place where we would be comfortable with something like that not that our lives would be perfect not that we would never sin or we would never fail you know not that but that we would be so confident in our hearts with god and who we are in god our hearts intents our hearts motives like i want to use those words because that's really what it is that your motive is so pure that even if you mess up, even if you sin, even if you know something happens and you just explode or whatever, you'd be okay with that flashing before God or being before God in that moment. Be and even before people, I wanna add that because if you care so much about what people think that you would disregard what God thinks, that's a problem right so i think we have to get to a place where it's about my heart's pure i may have gone about it the wrong way but my heart's motive was pure i know that that's what god cares about and i'm gonna do better and i'm gonna seek god and i'm gonna get wisdom i was just talking to my daughter about that because of a situation that she's having at school with some friends and i had to say hey you know the truth sometimes you have to be confident in the truth it's not always going to look pretty and it's not always going to work in your favor. But I think that what you mentioned on there is a good point. Like he's pretty much alluding like people aren't always worshiping in spirit and truth, but there will come a time where they will and they can do it from anywhere. And one thing we can get out of this passage so far, we just on some of the verses is that this woman maybe she had a bible <laughs> maybe she read the bible the scrolls uh, i don't know from where from the synagogue or something because as we read she says i know the messiah is coming yep. right why something is clicking in her spirit right because there's jesus is not telling her giving her much hint if we just read it a plain reading it's not but for some reason he's saying he's talking to her and she 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 must have been thinking oh i heard this from someone you know yes and, Go ahead. and that is the messiah that's why when we we read this if we don't pay attention we go oh this is a casual conversation this is no it's not it's not normal because jesus is not telling her you know this uh, there's a guy that will come one day and this and that no she just brings that out into the conversation yeah and i i do want to talk a little bit about the samaritan woman a lot of times we're going to see in john that when someone is talking to jesus and they ask him something or say something to him jesus's response is a little weird like he's not really answering the question it's kind of you know so so you have to then question so one of the things as we continue going through the through john and we read it um that i want you to ask yourself as you study this is always ask yourself what or or look for what's off here something's off here this doesn't make sense and when that happens, dive into it, look into it, try, try to understand. Don't 
don't create a story based on speculation without having some sort of educated process to get there. So let me give you an example. Historically, because I think we've all been Christian for a while. What have we heard about the Samaritan woman? So what's her reputation, would you say? Promiscuous. She loves romance. Promiscuous. She loves romance. <laughs> um, I've heard, you know, she was an outcast. That's why she went to the well at noon. In the middle of the day. Well, that I don't agree with that. I'm going to tell you why. As you know, I was in Africa, Mozambique, and women go to the well all day long, but especially at noon, lunchtime, because they need a lot of water. So that to me, again, when you don't know anything, you hear things, you agree, oh, because, you know, she she was afraid, you know, like Nicodemus, he went at night because he was shy, and the Bible does not say that. He was scared, all that guy. The woman, too, people say that. It's because of this, but that's not that's not the case. For and, us, maybe weird because it's hot. So what? They still need water. You need water. Right. And And I think that's an important thing to know as we read scriptures, especially if you're someone who's read the Bible numerous times, you know, you've been Christian for a long time. When you have these notions or these ideas about a passage and you're reading it, you need to look and say, wait, this is what I think about this person or this situation or this. Is that what the text is actually saying? Does the text tell me that? Because to the new to um, dad, your point at the well, um, another thing that we don't know is, was it even summer? because everyone's speculating that it was in the middle of the day in summer right like we don't know what time of year it was for it to be hot for it not to be for it to be an odd time for it to go to the well the other thing is the hottest moment of the day is actually 3 p.m and not 12. um and then another thing to know is that in jewish culture at that time wells were actually a sacred place they were a communal place people would go to commune, you know, like my dad was saying, the women go to the well, they they get water, but it's also considered a sacred place. And on top of that, we need to remember that this wasn't just any well, this was Jacob's well. This was a place that God was, right? So how do we know that she didn't go at noon to get water, but to also pray? We, we don't know that. Again, that's speculation as well, but it's important for us to understand the fullness of what's happening for us to make an educated decision or choose how we're going to perceive it. Um, and that can change over time depending on, you know, your studies and, and what you learn and, and all that stuff. Um, in terms of her being promiscuous, Think about this. There was a rebellion just before this time, before Jesus. What if she had a husband that died in a war, in, in, in the rebellion, and she was widowed, and then she got married again? And during that time, the life expectancy was low. We don't know how old this woman was. And we don't know why her husband's passed, but we assume that she's promiscuous because she had five husbands and now she's one that's not hers, her husband. So there's that aspect to think about, but also you have to realize that the Jewish culture at that time and, and the, the Orthodox Jews are still this way, they're very patriarchal. So a woman cannot ask for divorce. It is the man that files the divorce and whether a woman wants a divorce or not she doesn't have a say it is the husband that determines if there's a divorce so we don't know if these were divorces we don't know if these were deaths but we know that if there were divorces this was not her say we don't know if she was barren and couldn't bear children and maybe one of her husbands divorced her because it was a shame 
And unfortunately, during that time, women who did get divorced or sometimes became a widow, they had and they had no one to marry, no no lineage to, to marry, you know, brothers and stuff. They sometimes found themselves in really not good predicaments because they were women, second class citizens, and they had to resort to things to just survive and live, especially if they didn't have children. If they had children and they got divorced, the husband had to pay her for the, you know, because of the children. So there's all these things surrounding the culture that when you understand that it's like, why in our Western world are we concluding that this woman is a prostitute or a sexual deviant? Why is it that most women in the Bible, when we read about them, we assume they're sexual deviants? There's something wrong with them. Think and about look, it. Look, look, let's read what the text says. You see, our problem, our problem is that we, we inject many times wrong thoughts into the text. Mm -hmm. Look how Jesus Jesus did not tell her, hey, you had five guys, you slept with five guys. No, he said, you had five husbands. Right. What's a husband? It's a married person. Let's, let's not go into discuss marriage right. and divorce and all that. So nothing wrong with that. Correct. But now he's pointing the finger a little bit gently saying, listen, the one you have now, that's not your husband right like you have some sin in you right now right but he does not reprimand her right he does not say anything else it just shows her the truth said so this last guy the other five guys like you said maybe they married maybe because they could divorce for any reason any silly reason they could mm -hmm. divorce a wife they started the process they were the ones that would give the wife what Jews call the get. Here's a certificate of divorce. And this is something we don't talk much in churches. Right. We just talk about the this and that. And that's you only can uh, remarry if uh, one of them cheated or died. That's it. But there's a lot more than that. So he's just saying, uh, just he's telling her, listen, something is off in your life right now. Yep. It's not about the five husbands that you had. It's about this one now that is, he is not your husband, but he does not accuse her. Right. And he um, points out like you were honest about it. Yes. That's what he does. Yeah. So, so that's a great news for her. <laughs> Go ahead, Caridon. So in, um, you know, my study Bible, it talks about Samaria mm -hmm. and it talks about, um, the Samaritans and how they've been despised because they had intermarriages. So the Jews and the Gentiles were actually marrying each other. And this is part of where um, I believe the history comes from that other people spoke about. Uh, and this is my guess because this is only stories I've heard. I've never had this actually kind of conversation about this scripture, uh, particularly with anyone but you guys. So it says the Samaritan people had been despised by the Jews since the Old Testament time due to their intermarriage with the Gentile people who they lived. And then it says, and due to their belief that Mount Gerizim, not Jerusalem, no. was a place mm -hmm. appointed by God for sacrifice when Christ first commissioned the, anyway. That's what it said there. And that just kind of like said a lot as to where I believe people had been saying. So basically it has to do with the times in which they were in, why people um, were despised for Gentiles and Jews marrying. Yeah, so um, I don't know if I shared it, but I'll share it after. So the Samaritan people came about, which, they still exist. So they're not fictitious people from the past. There's actually still Samaritan people alive. It's about a thousand of them. Um, the Samaritans came out of, of the exile because when they then left, 
they were together with the Egyptian with with Babylonians and yeah. they they did intermarry so to the Jewish people to the Pharisees they looked at them like you're a mixed people group you're not pure anymore but the Jewish people the Pharisees they had their midrash their oral teachings and they started to develop the Talmud which was Talmud which was I think that's how you say it which is the it was started off as oral traditions but then they started writing it down which are all the laws it's it's all like I don't know how to explain it exactly but basically if I were to say in layman's terms it's rules to keep you from breaking the law so God gave the Ten Commandments God gave them laws but as we know with the Sabbath there's details as to how many steps you can take in a day how much weight you can carry you know what you can and cannot do those were all in our language we would call those extra biblical things but they were meant to protect people so they wouldn't break the law the samaritan people were against that they felt that the pharisees were adding to the word of god and they were devoutly um, set on it is the torah which the torah are the first five books it is a torah that we follow and we follow this is how the samaritans felt we follow the pure unadulterated gospel we we have the word of god we are worshiping god where he told us to worship this is where we're supposed to be where jacob's well was right and then the pharisees had these oral traditions and these teachings and all this stuff and so the samaritans felt like that they're adding to it's the same stuff that happens today guys if you think about it they're adding to and the pharisees were like well you're not pure because you're not 100 percent israelite right like you're you're a mixed people group so you have these two people who hated each other i wrote about this in my book and the in the chapter titled love your neighbor because the jewish people knew that you're supposed to love your neighbor but they also had in the law as we hear jesus talk about you've heard it said that um you don't have to you can hate your enemy basically and they looked at the samaritans like the samaritans were their enemy so they didn't have to love the Samaritans because they were enemies. And Jesus came in and Jesus taught them, no, the Samaritan is your neighbor. And that's when he gave the story of the, of the good Samaritan. And he showed like the Samaritan stopped. He was the good neighbor. Everyone is a neighbor. There's no one exempt from that. But during that time, I would equate their relationship to a hardcore conservative and a hardcore liberal and they can't even communicate they cannot talk they're unwilling to listen to each other they're stuck in their ways and there is good and there's bad on both sides maybe it's not 100 percent equal but more or less you get what i'm trying to say so it's i mean think about this and this is in terms of the samaritan people and the pharisees were like this too a little bit i believe we have to be careful that in our pursuit of God, that we don't come across as I have the pure, unadulterated revelation of God and you don't because no one will receive that well. And anyone who does say that, in my opinion, does not have the full revelation because <laughs> they wouldn't say that if they did, in my opinion. But yeah, the Samaritan people, there was a huge di distinction, a hatred between them. But it's interesting to note that in verse four, John said, but he had to pass through Samaria. And I think that that verse, yeah, it, all of it says he had to, like almost like he was obligated. And last week we started talking about this, but the we wound up not being able to finish that route was not the only way to get there and usually jews went around 
because they didn't go through Samaria because they didn't talk to Samarians. So it's interesting that John said we had to pass through Samaria because he didn't have to. So I think in my opinion, I see this as a moment where Jesus knew the father. He knew what was in the father's heart. He knew what God was saying, what God was doing in that moment. And he was following that lead. And he went through Samaria, this, this town. Um, and then he stopped at Jacob's well, which if you guys recall, this is not the first time we're only in chapter four. This is not the first time we've heard about Jacob. We keep hearing allu like these allusions to Jacob. So I find that super interesting. And I don't know if at some point we'll be able to tie that all together. Like why does John keep talking about Jacob? What it, What is he trying to tell us? What's so important about the story of Jacob that he finds it essential in this gospel that he's writing where his purpose is to reveal and to be witness to the fact that Jesus is Messiah. Because remember, that's the purpose of John's book. We haven't gotten that far, but that he's he says that later on in the book. His, the whole purpose of this is so that he could testify and witness that Jesus is Messiah. So it's just something to keep in mind to be as we read, to be like, what what's so important about the story of Jacob or Jacob's family? What, what why you know? Another another cool cool little thing that I wanted to share with you guys on Jacob's well, and this is where sometimes you have to you have to to look at what's being said and be like, that's not normal response. And then the Samaritan woman said. How can you, a Jew, ask me for water? And Jesus says, if you only knew the gift, like he's like, I'm a gift to you, right? Like if you only knew the gift, you'd ask me for water and I'd give it to you. But she's looking at Jesus, right? And she says, you don't have, you don't a, have bucket. a bucket. Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? So she's like, I can get you water but how are you going to get me water because you have no bucket right like what is it's kind of like that to me anyway that's not t a typical normal re response it just was a little off well in the targum which is part of the midrash and i shared a lot of information about that so that's all part of jewish culture not just now it's always been so these were oral traditions and oral stories that have had been passed down and they all knew them and in one of them there was this story which basically you can almost look at it like a commentary it was their commentary to the torah so in genesis 28 10 when it talks about jacob's um well there is this commentary in the story where there were miracles that happened with Jacob and this well. And the fourth, and there were five signs that they talk about. And in one Targum, it refers to it, it's the fifth sign. In another Targum, it's the fourth sign. But they both equally talk about how one of the miracles that happened was that when Jacob would be at the well, the well would overflow, the water would rise to the edge, meaning that Jacob did not need a bucket. Jacob could stand before the well without a bucket to pick up the water. Why am I saying this? Because then she said, surely you're not greater than our, than our ancestor Jacob, are you? Like, she's like, hey, you don't have a bucket to pick up this water. Who do you think you are, Jacob? It's, it's kind of like, what does Jacob drinking water have to do with anything? But when you realize Jacob did not need a bucket because the well would overflow. So now she's referring to that and saying, and this is why dad, to your point, she had to have known scripture. She had to have known Torah because she knew enough to know to relate the two together, in my opinion, because to me, once I read that, I was like, it's very clear that she's saying 
you don't have a bucket. How do you think you're going to get water? What do you think? You're like, Jacob, you're not like Jacob. So I thought that that was interesting because it's those little backstories that we don't understand. And then all of a sudden it makes more sense. And what that does for me is it causes me to look deeper in the text and say, what else am I missing? Because maybe this is a small little thing, but what if in another passage, it's something huge and I'm missing the depth of what Jesus is saying or the conversation that's happening because I simply don't know the context. I don't know the culture of the time. So that's why I want to share these things with you because I want you to, to be exposed to what different people say, the culture of the time to help you read scripture and have it come alive to you. So that's what I'm saying. The story of the T Samaritan woman in itself, on its superficial level, you read it for what it is, is powerful all on its own. But if you really dive in and you start looking at this stuff, you're like, this conversation that Jesus is having with this woman is pretty cool. Where was like, where was this well at? And what mountain? It was on that Mount um, Haran. Like Carad is it called? Caradon said, uh, Gerizim, Gerizim. What does that word mean? I there were know. two. There were two mountains. That means the mountain of blessing. And there was another mountain. It's well, it's not far from this one. It's Mount Ebal. That's the mountain of curse. They're identical, but in one you have everything. You have food. You have water. You have grass. You everything. And the other one, nothing grows, right? Wow. And what? As you are talking, I'm I'm thinking. How does Jesus goes to this place? where Jacob's well is at, at this particular mountain, that it, it is a mountain blessing. And what greater blessing than go to a place where you, you meet people and he had to go there, as we read. We, he had. He does not say we, him and the disciples had to go. No, no, no. This is him yeah, good as point. a person. He had to go. and what greater blessing than go somewhere where you'll find somewhere unique that you never met and bring that person to the knowledge of God and to the knowledge of Messiah right that's that is the great the greatest thing he had to go again why did he have to go listen he had to go like maybe some of us one day we'll just kind of hear God whispering in our hearts, hey, you have to go here, you have to go there. You go to the supermarket for some reason, you go, what? Go to the supermarket for what? I know, but it's like you have to go there. And if you go and obey, something great will happen, right? And look what happened. Not only she knew the master uh, in person, but how many more we came to the knowledge knowledge of Christ, right? This all has to do with obedience. And she kind of could have bragged, like we're talking about Jacob. She, she is bragging because she's in the right spot physically. She's in the right location, you know, but you may be in the right location, but you're serving, you're not serving God uh, the way you should. This woman, was intelligent she was not an idiot she knew more about scriptures than we 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 think she does or she did and the the thing is she opened herself she was receptive to this man you know she knew the story the relationship was not the best but the conclusion is she not only her eyes were open but her heart was open yeah, and I think you brought up a good point. You know, Jesus, it says Jesus had to go there. And that was a place, like even the disciples were probably like, what, we're going through Samaria. Why are we going, why are we going there? You know, we usually go all the way around because we don't want to talk to those people. But Jesus went to this, was going to walk through this town 
that the Jews despised, right? Mm -hmm. And why? Because there were, remember, Jesus came for all. He came so that no one would perish. He came so that all may be saved. This wasn't just about saving the Jews. This was about saving everyone in the world, saving humanity. And Jesus was not intimidated by going somewhere where one, he could be rejected because he was a Jew, and two, he was supposed to be rejected. Jesus didn't care what people had to say. You know, he heard the father calling and saying, this is where you have to go. And Jesus is saying, okay. You know, and sometimes, and it, what you were saying that is this is a communal place. This is where people come and meet, right? And these were people that were, you know, the Jews wouldn't, the Jews wouldn't go hang out with them. This was for the Samaritan people. And sometimes God is going to call us to go to a communal place with people that look different than us, believe different than us, act different than us. Why? Because that may be the only way that they get exposed to the living water. And that ends our adventure today. It's an honor that you've chosen to join us in this conversation. We'd love to know what you think, how this has blessed you, or even if you have any questions by sending an email to hello at andreajohn.com. To prepare for next week, continue diving deep through the story of the Samaritan woman in John 4. Here are some questions to help you explore. What does Jesus mean when he says that he is the living water? What does that mean to you? That'll allow you to join the conversation with your own study, perspective, opinions, and questions. And if we don't answer the question that you may have, you're always welcome to email us. Or if you have a perspective that we didn't cover, we'd love to hear about it. Because who knows, maybe I'll share it in one of the sessions. So thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Until then, have a blessed day.